So if uh, someone could uh, lead us in a word of prayer, that will get us started for this morning. Prince, would you be able to pray? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please go ahead, Prince. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. This time, Lord, we come before you, Lord. In this morning, Lord, help us to, Lord, we are going to learn from your word, Lord, help us. This class, Lord, bless. And also I pray each student, Lord, keep us the revelation that we receive, whatever we receive, or we apply in your life. In our life, Lord, thank you in this time. Lord, as we are going to uh, the book of who loved us, Lord, same in your hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Prince. Thank you for leading us. We will uh, continue from where we stopped. Uh, we had stopped at chapter 3. So there were some key things that we saw there. Uh, we were talking about uh, loving brothers and sisters in Christ and how if there is a need, we must respond to that need and that reveals the love of God that we have for them. And uh, just looking uh, further back, we saw how John is encouraging God's people to uh, love because you know, love comes from God, to be holy because God is holy, to be pure because God is pure, to be righteous because God is righteous. So he, he kind of encourages the believer to walk in everything that God already is. And that is the calling for uh, the lives of the believers. So uh, in what we are learning from the book of John, we understand that God is calling us for a lifestyle that depicts his perfect nature. Okay? Uh, and if we know this nature of God and we don't adapt that lifestyle or adapt is also not the right word because we are born again and we know that we have the ability to uh, have the life of God in us and to live the kind of life that God has called us to live, to be here on the earth the way Jesus was walking the earth, you know, uh, be an example uh, with the very nature of God, displaying the fruit of the Spirit, walking in the power of the Spirit, all that is possible because of the transformation which we have already experienced uh, by the uh, work of redemption. So uh, what we are learning here for practical life, it's not uh, unattainable. Because if we categorize it in that way and think that God is calling us to do things which are beyond uh, our capacity, we will uh, never be right uh, because we are not understanding the work which God has already done in us. So because he has done the work in us, we are able to live it out and fulfill whatever John is calling us to do. Uh, so we will continue from there. Today we are going to look at uh, 1 John chapter 4. Uh, again, it carries several themes. So we will go over the themes that are there in this book. So we are going to talk about uh, loving God, loving one another, uh, and uh, understanding God or knowing God through the love uh, that we have for him. Uh, and you know how that is demonstrated by uh, living it out by uh, living the life of uh, care and concern and love for other uh, believers in God. So we're going to look at, you know, the understanding. Uh, basically, it talks a lot about the love of God. Okay? So we will delve right into that. Uh, so as we begin uh, this passage, so again, we are not going to read through the entire passage passage if that's what we had uh, discussed so i'm just gonna go over it and it'll be good if you can have the uh, bible open in front of you and look at the verses so starting off from verse one you know uh, john writes he says uh, that we must not believe every spirit okay but test the spirits whether they are from god uh, and he says there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world so when uh, john is writing this we have to understand even earlier he talked about the antichrist 
okay uh, and uh, he in fact said there are many there are many and they don't acknowledge the lord jesus as uh, uh, you know christ uh, so who are these people in this case he is pointing out and he is saying that there are many false prophets so is finding a false prophet in that time and generation uh, uh, that common because he is using this term as if there are people who don't speak the truth of god's word it looks like this was something that was uh, observed in the times of john as well now for us in our times we might uh, look at scripture and say that you know in the last days there will be many false prophets we see the book of jude <coughs> you know excuse me talking about it. we see second peter talking about it a lot of uh, uh, apostates people who do not say that the lord jesus is christ and they teach uh, false things they prophesy false things but more specifically in this passage you know, he says false prophets okay so the words which are spoken by people are not accurate they are not by the spirit of god and which is why he says that we must test all spirits so he says do not believe every spirit so when we talk about prophecy we know that prophecy is a gift of the holy spirit it is initiated by the spirit of god now just because there is prophecy it doesn't mean that it is from god or similarly any work of the spirit we must test the spirit behind it or the source behind it now a good example is when you uh, talk about moses coming out of egypt with the people he goes to pharaoh to negotiate he goes to pharaoh to speak the word of god and to give the command of god and say you let my people go uh, but when he does that there are sorcerers who the pharaoh has and uh, they are able to perform similar miraculous signs the way moses did now moses was demonstrating the supernatural and pharaoh's uh, ministers sorcerers they were demonstrating the supernatural so the supernatural existed the question is not whether something is supernatural or not the question is the source of the supernatural because the source for moses was god himself god's power was working through moses and you know he uh, did those signs where he took his rod moses is rod the famous rod right it became a snake he was able to uh, pick it up and, and all of that but at the same time the sorcerers could do similar things but at the end of it we know you know god demonstrated his glory because the uh, snakes that were produced by the sorcerers were eaten up by moses's uh, snake so god showed his power and his glory so i think you're getting the point the supernatural can exist out there the question we must ask when we see the supernatural is what is the source Uh, and we know Jesus when he taught about the Holy Spirit, he said he will lead you into all truth. When he taught about the Holy Spirit, he said he will take, uh, you know, what what is mine and he will give it to you. And when he taught about the Holy Spirit, he also said that he will glorify me. So, the work of the Holy Spirit in the demonstration of the supernatural work of God must be tested. If that work is glorifying Jesus. if that work is in agreement with the lord jesus we will see that in chapter 5 okay, there is an agreement the spirit and the word agree it says okay so what the holy spirit does is in agreement with jesus he is the logos he is the word so there is an integrity there is a harmony in the godhead the holy spirit will not try to do something which is uh, totally outside of the will of the trinity so when we see a supernatural work which is from god it will glorify god 
it will agree with God. Now, what is John saying? Looks like there were false prophets during his times. And so he's warning the people and he's saying, do not believe every spirit. So do not believe every uh, uh, word that is prophesied. Or he's saying, do not believe every supernatural work that you see. But does he mean that you must discard it right away? No. His point is that we must judge it. So whenever we see something, whenever we hear something, the first thing that we have to do is, does the Holy Spirit bear witness to what is going on? Is it from the Spirit of God? So his point is to test, not to discard straight away. So he says, do not believe or in a simple way, taking it in. Don't do that. But test the spirits. So test the spirits means we obviously know there is an entire demonic realm out there and uh, they can speak words uh, that are lies. They can uh, speak accusation, condemnation. Uh, their direction and instruction will lead us into uh, damage, destruction for our lives, even death. So there are so many spirits out there. So which spirit is speaking is the question before us. Then he says, whether they are of God. So we are testing them out because there are many false prophets of people who are led by these demon spirits who are so-called ministering. And he says, you know, they have gone out into the world. Okay. Now. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, it will be good if somebody can read that passage, please. 2 Peter 1, verses uh, 20 through 21. Can you turn in your Bibles and read that? 2 Peter 1, 20 to 23, ma'am. Tw uh, 20 and 21. Okay. Yeah. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy come not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Dave. So, you know, uh, it's right there. We are told that prophecy is not by the will of God. Obviously, it's a gift of the Spirit and it is initiated by the Spirit. Okay? It's not by the will of man. So, if I say something out of my mind, how can that be a blessing to the people? Yes, if it is a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a word of instruction. So uh, I was talking about uh, Paul the Apostle, uh, who also talked about judging the spirits. Okay, uh, Or in other words, judging the work of the spirit. So when he talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 29. He says that we must uh, have a group of people who actually judge the prophetic word. So why judge? There is no problem with the word that God releases. God's word is true. And uh, 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 the source is perfect. But when the word is released, if there is an issue with the interpretation of that word, then uh, others who are uh, in the Lord and who are matured in the Lord, they will be able to pick it up. right? Or if it is from a different spirit and not from the Holy Spirit, you know, people who have walked with the Lord, well-versed with the word of God, they can immediately pick it up because by virtue of practice as Hebrews uh, 5 teaches us. So judging the spirit is very important. Judging the word is very important. Now judging the word does not mean that we are judging in a negative way the individual who is bringing the word, not at all. But we are just uh, careful about testing the spirit behind the word and the word which is being proclaim to us. Now, similarly, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, you know, he says, test all things and hold on to what is good. So again, that element of testing, not because God's word has an error in it, but, you know, it is the, the, in the, 
a process of delivering that word uh, if there is an error of some sort from the human side or for whatever reason you know if it is not from god but if it is from a different spirit then you know that is not something that we want uh, to follow and john wanted the believers to be mature enough the believers to be discerning enough right to determine who are the false prophets what is the word that they are bringing because when we depend on untruth it can put us in bondage do you remember john uh, uh, he we will look at that also as we go forward in the book of john we have that scripture where john said that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free so what is a characteristic of truth truth will deliver us truth, truth will uh, liberate us truth will help us to live our lives better because uh, we are going by the instruction of god himself but when we base our lives on untruth or lies okay what happens uh, we put ourselves in a dangerous position uh, and and you know i i don't have to say too much about this because we've already uh, studied uh, this course on uh, uh, prophecy understanding the prophetic okay so uh, we must be careful about the spirits behind the word which is being proclaimed to us now uh, i think kiran had a question and because of uh, because i got disconnected that is erased from my chat uh, can you repeat that uh, kiran i was going to come to that question you had something yes ma'am ma'am ma how long the uh, evil spirit can hold a believer Mm. and let believers to imagine something different that is maybe not from god and from god's way how long ma'am is it possible or how long mm. good question kiran good question yeah so uh so you see that uh, when we speak right uh, that word comes from our heart uh, so it comes from our spirit uh, it also comes from our soul okay so the mind part of us because we receive it in our spirit and we speak it out now uh, if you recall when we studied about uh the soul right of of a of a human being of a believer uh we also touch on a uh, renewing of the mind okay and uh, taking every thought captive and bringing it under the subjection of uh, uh the lordship of our lord jesus christ now if a believer is not walking with a renewed mind they are actually opening themselves up to danger okay now if they are not careful enough now if you know one of uh, something goes wrong holy spirit is convicting you and then you you repent of that wrong mindset uh, you yield yourself to the word of god you commit yourself to the word of god you renew your mind it's fine but if a believer continues in untruth uh, and is averse to uh, changing their mindset according to the word of god so you see this whole thinking pattern right uh, of being renewed by god's word is very very important and it also strengthens the will of the individual so the point i want to make is how long you are straight how long will will the the demon spirit uh, work in a believer because we know that believers can be demonized they, they cannot be demon possessed because the spirit in us is the holy spirit but they can be demonized which means that in the strong holds uh, of our soul demon spirits can take charge now they will take charge as long as our will is agreeing 
to that. Okay, but the moment a believer decides, hey, I have the authority and I'm asking you to leave in the name of Jesus, then that demon spirit has to leave. So this is the dynamics in a believer. So it depends on the will of the believer. The moment you recognize I have the authority, why am I putting up with this? In Jesus name, I command you, the demon spirit, leave. That's it. So I can't tell you that a hey, one week, three months, 10 months. It's not like that. It's dependent on the will of the believer. The believer has to decide. It's in the, the ball is in the believer's court. God has already given the believer the authority. Okay. Uh, so does that make things clear, Kiran? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, that's the thing. But if we allow, uh, if we have open doors for the demon spirits uh, and we don't do anything about the strongholds within us, it's it's an act of our will only. Uh, if, you know, and over a period of time, it's it can get worse because our will can be weakened to an extent where even if we want to decide, we might find it difficult. So, you know, that then you uh, need external help, you need prayer, you need somebody to come help you and all of that. But uh, if initial stages, you know, the believer himself can take authority in Jesus name and rebuke that spirit and get that spirit out, then you would only minister by the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, that's the thing. So uh, there, there is uh, all this dynamics involved. Okay, so yeah, uh, again, prophecy, we said two sources. When we speak, we might, uh, you know, speak by the Holy Spirit as a believer. That is the default, right? You, we must minister by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but yeah, there are demon spirits also in the world out there. We know there are people who minister through demon spirits. Is there any other source that can bring the word? Holy yes, Spirit. Yes, ah, yes. Yes, Kiran. Tell me. No, no, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, how about our mind, the human spirit? Now, sometimes it's not from what we say is not from God, right? It could be our own spirit also. So you have your spirit, you have God's spirit. You have a, a voice of the enemy. But as we train ourselves, as we improve, right, uh, we grow in God, we come to a place where we are able to recognize. So let me just give you the scripture for that. Yeah, so... This is Hebrews 5 and verse 14. And I'm going to post it for us in the chat. Okay, I'll just give you the NIV version itself. Uh, okay, Hebrews 5 and verse 14. So it says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So how did we train ourselves? Look, concentrate on the train ourselves part. Good from evil, but also, you know, what is from God? What is from, what is my own voice? What is uh, the voice of the enemy? Train ourselves. So over a period of time, we are able to uh, mature and discern these things. And there's also the, working of the spirit of, uh, you know, the gift of discernment. So that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Even through that, we can tell. You know, sometimes when we listen to messages uh, or we listen to people sharing about God, uh, I don't know if it has happened to you, but it has happened to me. I remember once there was a particular book about uh, the occult, about, um, uh, you know, uh, like believers authority only but it had more description about uh, the demonic realm as compared to 
the work of God and the work of the cross and all that. So a good friend of mine uh, gave me that book and said, you must read it. You know, it talks about these kind of occult practices and those kind of occult practices. Uh, and the writer is a believer. She preaches and this and that. So, uh, but the moment the book was, you know, recommended, something within me said, don't read this book. Okay, it's not a good book because it is not going to edify you. Edify is build up. Now, if you ask me, the introduction was very good because the person said uh, she's a Christian lady, she's preaching, and, you know, she, there's a lot of scripture in there, um, talks about the occult, this and that. But I can't explain to you, but within my spirit, I was like, no, this is not good. This is not good for your spiritual work. You're not going to mature by reading this book. Your faith is going to be damaged if you read this book. You know, that sense came. Uh, and then I, I didn't say anything. I left it. Uh, and then I kind of came home and, you know, researched a little bit on the internet about this person and the book. And there were a lot of believers who had actually written about it. And they said, no, it's not good because uh, it's, it's the focus is going more on the demonic world than on the cross than on Jesus, than on exalting what Jesus has done. So, you know, we depend on the Holy Spirit to help us discern. So that's what John is saying. He's saying, we as believers, we must be very discerning. Don't believe every spirit, okay? Uh, but recognize, if at all, there is the voice of the enemy there. And he, uh, in this scripture, is warning them about false prophets. So let's go further. It says, by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses Jesus, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So is distinguishing between these two spirits. I told you earlier, the work of the Holy Spirit, one of the uh, tasks of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit will testify to our spirits that Jesus is indeed fully God. Right? We've, we've talked about that. He's fully man. If at all, you know, there is any confusion in that, the Holy Spirit will never tell us that, oh no, he was never fully God. Or he was never fully man when he walked in. Because we know the Godhead is in agreement, in harmony. So uh, they will say the same thing. Now if a spirit is telling us, and in this case, John points out and he says, uh, if the spirit says or confesses that Jesus Christ has uh, not come in the flesh, Okay? It is not of God. So the humanity of Christ, the denial of the humanity of Christ, that would not be from the spirit of God. Okay? So why does it matter for us, the humanity of Christ? If someone claims that, yes, the Lord Jesus is deity, or he is God himself, um, that's fine. And if they say he was never really fully human here on the earth, he still was God. He walked as God. How does it affect us as believers? What do you think? Why is the humanity of Christ important? I think uh, Christ being a human uh, was the, the, the reason that he was uh, um, like uh, humans uh, are fetal, they are, they are um, weak and um, the ultimate thing is that Jesus was supposed to die uh, as, an, as a sacrifice. So if Jesus was not a human, 
how would he be possible? How would he die if he was killed? Uh, God. Um, so he had that business. So if he had to be the sacrifice, and he had to die, and he had to definitely be human. Yes, thank you, thank you, Dev. Yeah, very uh, pertinent points there. If he was not a human, how could he become a sacrifice? Because the whole point of the Lord Jesus coming here to the earth was to be that perfect sacrifice. And, you know, somebody among us needed to die for that. Uh, and that is why we see Philippians 2, that you know, he became, uh, he, he put away his heavenly glory and he became a little lesser. Remember, it says uh, lesser than the heavenly beings. And he came into the world. What is that lesser? Becoming human. Right? Becoming human and not carrying the sun, that uh, heaven's glory which he had while in heaven. So, uh, Kiran, you want to add to that? I saw you uh, unmute. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just little want to add, like in carnation, sonship glory, the Jesus Christ left uh, on the uh, heaven and he just came on the uh, earth and he was fully God and fully human being. He have that uh, he has that emotional and pain that uh, in, and feelings and everything. So yeah, ma'am. Yes, yes, Kiran, uh, that's true. Uh, Yes, so he became fully human, and uh, Kiran was describing how he was. He became finite, okay, limited to this world in a mortal body. And there's so much to actually talk about the humanity of Christ. Even in the book of Hebrews, it talks about how he became obedient through his sufferings. Okay, uh, we read about how. Uh, he became a captain because he's also gone through the things that we go through. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So all these experiences uh, happen to human beings, right? Temptation, suffering, uh, you know, you could talk about uh, other physical limitations. If Jesus had the glory of heaven here on earth, I don't think he would need to walk around because we read that in the 33 uh, years uh, that he lived here, he covered, I think, something like 200 miles. Uh, that was the radius in which he actually walked. So, limited to the physical body, hunger, right? He, uh, he hunger, he had broke bread, gave thanks, I'm sure he participated in eating. Uh, that lunch as well. So, you know, he was limited in every way to the human body. So when we deny the humanity of Christ, as they rightly pointed out, he cannot be that atonement price. He cannot be the perfect sacrifice. So if he's not the perfect sacrifice, then we have to wait for somebody else. So there is the very denial that Jesus is Christ or the Messiah or the anointed one. So that is the problem when we say that Jesus was not fully human. And in those times when John was uh, administering to the church, uh, there was Gnosticism. Okay? And as part of Gnosticism, there were grand teachings about, they did not deny that the Lord Jesus uh, was God, but they denied his humanity. So what were they doing? They were actually saying that the Lord Jesus is not Christ and there lies an issue. So John wanted to warn the people. You see, there, were, there was a lot of uh, wrong philosophy, wrong teaching, all of those things going around. So as a good teacher, uh, John is warning them and saying, there are false prophets. There is a spirit. There is a spirit that says that Jesus was never a human. Okay. And he clearly you know, uh, indicates that this spirit 
is a spirit of the antichrist and as the name suggests anti is opposite anti is uh, uh, you know it is it is denying it is the opposite of christ right uh, so everything that is not christ so the spirit of antichrist or in other words it's a demonic spirit which will not let us confess the lord jesus as christ okay uh, either denying his deity or denying his humanity in this case and even in those times uh, you know they had warned the people of the coming of the antichrist now in the previous passage we have seen that uh, there are many antichrists you know john says that but there is one person uh, who we are going to see uh, manifest on the face of the earth and uh, the end time events will unfold through the leading of that one individual so the antichrist uh, you know that that human being is yet to uh, i wouldn't say appear but uh, uh yet to manifest himself uh, and be recognized but the spirit is a demonic spirit which is uh leading that antichrist and everyone else who is denying the lord jesus as christ okay so we must steer clear of this spirit and the leading of this spirit we are moving on here in verse 4 he says uh, you are of god little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world so uh, in the writings of uh, the apostles generally even along with the warnings you will find words of encouragement uh, you will find words there uh, that will uh, build up the listener because imagine you know uh, i'm bringing you a warning uh, and uh, the intention is not to break your spirit right the intention is not to to uh, just say oh it's like this it's scary uh, okay you know you must not listen to them and all but the spiritual reality of who we are from time to time when when uh, we encourage the believers with that automatically they are able to live as per god's purpose and uh, god's calling because they know who they are right it's very important to know who we are so here john is bringing that in and he calls the believers as little children and he says that they have the ability to overcome this these uh, false prophets or antichrist that have gone out uh, he says greater is he that is in you that he that is in the world now the listeners whoever heard uh, john would have thought oh my goodness you know so there is a spirit that we must uh, uh, recognize uh, we must identify each time what if we make a mistake what if we don't discern right so there is that sense of uh, fear and insecurity that the believer might develop but in a correct way you know john is stepping in and he say you know what you actually don't have to worry because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world so the spirit that is working in us who is that spirit he is the holy spirit of god and rightly he is pointing out and he say this spirit who is in us he is much greater so whenever we talk about believers authority you know i like to uh, say this that there is no comparison of satan and god they are not equals at all okay so uh, just for our understanding if we think that satan is is like a mustard seed then uh, uh, god would be as large as the sun okay it's it's original size of the sun just for our illustration i'm sure uh, even that is not a proper comparison but they are not equals so whenever we look at the demonic realm we must not get scared and say oh my goodness how are we going to deal with this because god is much greater he is much higher so greater is he who is in you than he that is in the 
world. Remember in 1 John chapter 2, John pointed out about this world. And he said that a believer who is, you know, uh, given over to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the world systems, we call it the world systems from the Greek word cosmos. Okay? Uh, that believer, he's not really demonstrating the life of God. So once again, there is a spirit in the world that tempts us into sinful uh, ways of living and does not want us to, to uh, live and represent the nature of God. What spirit is that? It is the spirit of the Antichrist. It is the uh, spirit of, spirit from the demonic realm. It is uh, a work of the enemy. Okay, But we must always remember that even when we talk about the enemy, if we fully understand our authority as believers, we are way uh, you know, greater in the potential that we have, overcoming power that we have because of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, right? Who is God's Spirit. And uh, Satan can never compare with that. So there is a word of encouragement for the believer, even as the believer wants to walk right and discern these demonic spirits. Moving on. He says that you know these, these people of the world, uh, they speak as of the world and the world is comfortable with them and listens to them. But again, he keeps reminding the believers, look, remember the nature of God. Remember your nature as well, who you have become in Christ Jesus. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That is one thing that he said. And now he's saying, we are of God. We are of God. Just in saying, addressing the, the people as children. So we also know the same John. Uh, John 1 verse 12, he writes and he says that when we accept Christ into our lives, we become children of God. Okay, So he knows who we are. And he's reiterating that to the believer and he's saying, don't forget the nature of God. Don't forget your born again nature as well. So you are of who? You are of God. So you have come from God, so to speak, and you belong to God. And he says, because you are of God. Uh, I, I'll just read that uh, verse for you. He says, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So now pointing to these people right, who are of the world and he says the world is very comfortable to listen to them. Obviously you know, lies, uh, things for pleasure, uh, things that make one feel good. Uh, things that never point out somebody's mistake. But these things will keep the people of the world very comfortable. And so he says, the people of the world, when they speak, the world is very happy to listen to them. But we are of God. Uh, and the dynamics within the, the body of Christ and, and the believers must be that because we are of God, you know, we, we are rejoicing in the truth. We listen to one another and we rejoice in the truth. Remember, we talked about love when we started this uh, study on, on the book of John. And we said the God kind of love, First Corinthians chapter 13, what characteristic of that love is? It rejoices in the truth. Now, truth may not always be pleasant to digest, but true love will rejoice in the truth of God's word. Even if that truth is pointing out things which make us a little uncomfortable. Okay. But true love will rejoice in the truth. And just the opposite of that. You know, uh, whatever is not love and the spirit of untruth that will rejoice in error. 
to be happy uh, in what is not of God and things that are uh, not glorifying God. Okay, things that are sinful. So uh, that's a little bit about um, you know the instructions that uh, John is writing to the believers, and uh, you know he he talked about the spirit, he talked about uh, discerning, and uh, now we will slowly go more into uh, the love of God and the demonstration of God's love. So at this point, let's go ahead and take a break. We will come back, uh, and then we will you know, go further from here. But if you have any questions about what we have talked so far, um, then please do bring it up in the next session. Okay, so uh, let's take a break class 10 minutes. Uh, and we'll be back after that. Thank you.